Hello there, welcome to the Saray channel and welcome to my Omnibus series. I've got so many of these Omnibuses that are going to come out so that you'll be able to listen to an hour's worth of stories which I know you're going to love. You know, the thing is that telling stories is such a fine art and it's something that was practiced hundreds of years ago when people didn't have the technology that we have today. And everyone would gather around the fire and listen to a wonderful story. And also, what is so wonderful about a story is that, personally, I think it is the best way to go to sleep. Every night when I go to bed, I always listen to stories. And that's something that parents used to do with their children. It's something that they still do with their children. There's nothing better than a good story. And so I hope you're going to enjoy this series. And before we start, I just want to say, do subscribe to my channel because you don't want to miss out on anything because I'm in for the long haul and I want to make sure that you get the most stunning stories to go to bed with at night or to listen to when you want to be one of those people sitting beside the fire and listening. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel and let's get started. I hope you're going to enjoy the Omnibus. Dear Sarah, and all your listeners. It was in 1957 and I was 25 years old at the time and I was not married, unlike all my fortunate friends who not only had wonderful husbands but also beautiful babies on the way too. In those days being 25 and not married was really mu very much like being on the shelf or an old maid. Thankfully it's not like that today but that's how it was in my generation. I was living with my parents at the time in a large bungalow and even they were piling on the pressure, making things exceedingly awkward for me. They were begging me to get married. When is Roland going to do the decent thing and pop the question, my mother would constantly ask. You're not getting any younger and I'm longing for some grandbabies. I had been dating Roland for eight long years and he still had not asked me to marry him. I could not understand what was keeping him from making an honest woman out of me. After all, we'd been dating for a long time and we were incredibly close and very much in love. One day when I was sitting on my friend's lawn having drinks with some of my girlfriends, they all quizzed me about Roland's strange behaviour. You need to give him an ultimatum, said one of my friends. Otherwise, that dude is never going to pop the question. Everyone wholeheartedly agreed. If he doesn't want to marry you, well and good, said another friend. At least you know where you stand. You don't want to be 30 and left on the shelf. What they were saying made absolute sense to me. Even though it was not the done thing in those days for a woman to take the initiative in a marriage proposal, if I didn't give Roland a little push, we might never get married. And that thought was unconceivable to me. It was on a Sunday afternoon when Roland and I were taking a drive in his car around the countryside when I broached the very sensitive subject of marriage. Roland, I said, I'm 25 and I'm not getting any younger. Yeah, so he said with a dopey expression on his face. Don't tell you're telling me something I already know. Well, I want to get married and have kids, I said. Roland's mouth did a nosedive. And he looked at me with a horrified expression on his face, as if I'd just told him that he was sentenced to life imprisonment. You want to get married, he said. I nodded. We've been dating for over eight years, I said. It's the logical next step, isn't it? Isn't that something that we should do? We've been together for so long now. Roland's mouth was so wide, it looked like he would swallow an entire goldfish. That was how shocked he appeared. For a long while, the car was so silent, you could have heard a pin drop. Then he said absolutely nothing. He pressed down the accelerator with his foot and took me home as quickly as he could without saying a single word. Even when I got out of the car and slammed the door behind me, no word was said and he never even said goodbye. Tears rolled down my cheeks and I realised our relationship was well and truly over and that I was never going to hear from Roland again. 
The idea of marriage had completely freaked him out. Well, at least I knew where I stood, I thought regretfully. Imagine my surprise when about three days later, Roland called me and asked me out on a date. I could hardly believe it because I had truly resigned myself to the fact that we were well and truly finished. Roland told me to close my eyes as he led me into the beautiful clearing in the woods where he had prepared the most magnificent picnic for both of us. There was champagne on ice, strawberries dipped in chocolate, salmon sandwiches and turkey and cheese rolls, as well as chocolate cake. It was a sumptuous spread and I couldn't believe he'd gone to so much trouble on my account. I truly felt privileged and very lucky. Suddenly Roland got on his knees and presented me with a little box. Was this really happening? Was he about to propose to me? It just seemed too good to be true. He opened the box and I saw the most enormous, glistening, bright yellow diamond. Surrounded with clusters of pretty white diamond, staring back at me. I'd never seen such a beautiful ring in all my life. And he slipped it on my finger and yes, he popped the question. Will you marry me, Sue? He asked. Yes, yes, yes! I cried in joy, jumping up and down like an excitable puppy dog. The ring was very loose on my finger, but I didn't care. I knew I needed it to be adjusted, but I didn't say anything to Roland because I was so delighted and I didn't want to take it off. How could you afford a ring like this? I asked. It must have cost you an absolute fortune. Never you mind about that, said Roland. Only the best is good enough for you. I could not wipe the smile off my face and I raced to my best friend's house to tell her the good news. Oh, I'm so happy for you. It's about time too. Let's see the ring. Let's see the ring go on. Beth let out a huge gasp as she studied the splendid ring on my finger. Oh my goodness, she said. It is utterly breathtaking. I don't believe I've ever seen a more beautiful ring in my entire life. Did Roland rob the bank? Beth called her mother over to view my ring. Mum, you've got to see Sue's ring. It's extraordinary. I've never seen anything like this in my life. Beth's mum had a background in jewellery, so she knew all about diamonds and precious stones. So she studied my ring with a look of shock growing on her face. Where did Roland get this ring from? She asked. I've no idea, I said, but I'm so thrilled with it. I love the huge yellow centre and the diamonds surrounding the edge. It's so unusual. It is unusual. It's a yellow diamond, said my friend's mother. And it's worth a great deal of money. You're a very lucky girl. I looked at Beth and her mother in shock. And without knowing what to say, I excused myself quickly and hurried back home, rarely regretting the visit. You see, Roland lived in a very basic cabin on his parents' land, and all his life, both he and his parents had struggled financially. How on earth had he managed to present me with such an expensive stone? It just did not make sense, and that worried me. Feeling frustrated and bewildered by what had just happened at Beth's house and realising how valuable my ring was, I now had more questions than answers in my mind and my gut was not feeling good about this engagement ring. Something felt distinctly off. I decided to go for a run in the woods. That was my way of unwinding, letting go, clearing my mind, and letting off a little steam. I put on my running shoes and proceeded to go for a run, all the while wondering what I was going to do, and how I was going to broach Roland about the ring without sounding suspicious. I kept telling myself that maybe it had belonged to his mother once, yet why would they sit on a ring as valuable as this if they couldn't even afford to repair their leaky roof? That just didn't make sense to me. That evening I got another call from Beth. I think there's something odd about your ring, she said. My mother said it's worth a fortune. There's no way Roland has that kind of money. Something's going on. Are you sure it's worth a lot, I asked. Very sure. 
Also, my mother says, the, the stone is rare. I looked down at my finger to re-examine the stone, and I realised with horror that it was no longer on my finger. Oh, no, 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 I cried. What's the matter, asked Beth. I've lost the ring. It was loose on my finger, and it must have fallen off my hand, and I think I dropped it when I went running in the woods. Beth was horrified. Are you crazy? Wearing a ring as valuable as that on a run while it's loose on your finger? You'll never find it. I slammed down the phone in a panic. What was I to do? It was getting dark outside and my precious ring was lying somewhere in that woods and I needed to retrieve it. The idea of waiting until the morning to find it was inconceivable. And besides, I would only be lying awake all night worrying about it. I grabbed my father's brand new 1960s metal detector and bounded towards the woods with only one thing on my mind and that was to retrieve the ring. As I approached the woods it was airily quiet and yet during the day it had been full of pretty bird song. There were no animal sounds, no owls, no crickets and no calls of coyotes. I heard none of those noises that we would normally hear on a nightly basis. It really gave me an ominous, disturbing feeling that I just did not like. Needless to say, nothing was going to deter me from my mission. The ring needed to be found and its questionable value made it that much more significant. I started using the metal detector around the whole area where I usually go running. And I was retrieving all kinds of stuff like old screws and coins I realised that this job was going to be daunting and could take all night because the beeper continued to go off because someone had clumsily sprinkled piles of rusting nails all over the forest floor and at this rate I would never find the ring. Suddenly I heard the most terrifying noise and truly it sounded more supernatural than natural, almost like galloping horses' hooves racing through the forest at a thousand miles an hour but they were heavier than that, and whatever it was, I could tell it was coming in my direction, and very fast. I quickly got out of the way, and hid behind a massive tree that had all the moss growing up its girth. The thundering sound came to a sudden stop, only yards away from me, and I could hear a distinct grunting sound that sounded exactly like an ape. I was almost too terrified to peek at the creature, to see what it was, I could sense that it had a formidable presence of an apex predator. I did not have to see the creature to know that, because I could sense how powerful and strong it was, and even if my eyes were closed, I could feel that powerful presence. I peered through a hollowed opening in the cavity of the trunk of the tree, and luckily shafts of moonlight twinkled through the trees and lit up the creature's body. I got a really good side view of the creature, and he was enormous. He was bipedal and humanoid in his appearance, although he was definitely not human. He had dark hair covering his entire body, but I detected the side of his long greyish face had absolutely no hair. He had a very strong brow ridge, very flat dark skin nose, very wide deep set eyes and thin lips. I was amazed how much detail I could see under the moonlight and that was when I realised it had to be a full moon and the canopy above my head must have had an enormous opening to allow this much light to stream through. I was awestruck by this creature and terrified by him at the same time. If he saw me, I was certain that I would be table scraps for him. This creature was utterly enormous and at a guess he was at least seven foot tall and 600 pounds, and possibly even more. I have never been good on measurements, but this humanoid thing, whatever it was, was massive. The creature just stood there and sniffed the air, and I realised with horror that he could have detected my human smell. However, the breeze that night was fortunately blowing in the opposite direction, and that might have been to my advantage. He continued to sniff and then his attention was diverted to something that was wiggling frantically in the brush. It was a deer that had got snagged up in a thorn bush and was frantically trying to escape. 
because it had sensed the impending danger, and it got more and more ensnared the more it tried to wriggle. His struggle and distress sounds truly succeeded in only drawing attention to itself. This was an easy meal for this predator, and he wasted no time in lunging towards it, and it had no hope of escaping. And I heard a loud snap, the sound of a limb being disabled, which I imagine was to immobilize the creature so that it couldn't run away. Then I heard a loud rustling sound and a dragging sound as the deer was pulled through the brush. And then there was this thunderous thud. I think the hairy humanoid threw the deer's body against the tree trunk I was hiding behind with such a force that the deer must have been instantly killed. I felt a huge empathy for the poor little creature to have been killed in such a violent way. For a moment all was still and everything seemed very silent and then I heard the creature whistling to himself in the way that a human would. Suddenly I could hear slapping sounds around the woods coming from further away and then the creature responded by slapping the very tree trunk that I was hiding behind. Believe me, he slapped it so hard that I almost jumped out of my skin. I was so terrified. Then I heard these strange calls, almost like whooping sounds, that seemed to be coming from different areas of the woods that sounded like some form of interactive communication. And it was with horror I realized that there were others around, just like him. And the thought of this sent waves of terror flooding through my entire body and I was shaking like a leaf. By this time I was so terrified and so anxious of being discovered by the creature, I was so surprised that he had not detected me, because I was sure that I must have some kind of human odour, because this creature had a smell all of its own that was so pungent and dreadful that it reminded me of raw sewage, so surely I had some kind of a smell too. I continued to hang on to the hope that the wind was indeed blowing my scent in the opposite direction. Then I remembered that the woods were visited regularly by human hikers on a daily basis, and who knows, maybe the woods were filled with traces of their lingering smells. That's the only hope that I could explain why this creature did not see me, because he may have felt that my smell was from a hiker early in the day, that is, of course, if he did get a whiff of me. I peered at the creature and saw him scratching himself with a very long stick, very much like those bath brushes we have for scrubbing our backs. He used the stick to rub up against his back in the places that he couldn't reach, and he found an area that obviously was particularly itchy, and he scratched that area for some time. And as he did this, I could hear him making low moans of pleasure, as if he was finally satisfying a very frustrating itch that he'd possibly had all day. I then suddenly heard this thunderous galloping sound coming towards the clearing, and by this time I was freaking out because I knew what that sound was. Whatever it was did not come into view, but started to chatter towards the creature, which went on for a few seconds, and both creatures appeared to be engaged in this weird kind of conversation that sounded as if they were speaking gibberish, but they did clearly understand each other. It was almost like the other cre creature, well that's the impression I got, had come to get him to go back to where they were probably nesting. The creature threw the deer over his shoulder and trampled through the dense thorny thicket, and that wasn't a, any barrier to him whatsoever, and he thundered away. I could hear two of these creatures tearing through the forest like a couple of massive bulldozers, and when they moved, the trees swayed under their great girths, and these were big trees we're talking about. After they had gone, all was very silent, and then suddenly the chorus of crickets started to sing again, and I could hear the sounds of the owls and the coyotes. It was almost as if the conductor was saying, Come on, now we can get singing again. In my terror, I just fled away from the forest as fast as I could, and I left my dad's metal detector behind on the forest floor, and even the precious diamond ring was lying there somewhere, and I didn't care anymore. 
I just needed to get as far away from this forest as I could. It was weird because I seemed to have a delayed panic response that evening, after I had seen that creature. And when I got home, I broke out into an anxious sweat all over my body, and I started hyperventilating. My mother, seeing me in this dreadful state, and not knowing what was wrong with me, immediately called the emergency services, and I was rushed to hospital immediately that night. Everyone thought I was having a cardiac arrest, and so did I. I even remember thinking that the creature may not have killed me in the forest, but he was killing me now due to the post-traumatic shock I was suffering. I was later to discover that I just suffered from a panic attack. It took me a while to calm down, but I returned home several hours later with a clean bill of health, only to be even more anxious when Beth phoned me the following morning. I don't know how to say this to you, she said, but the ring Roland gave you, I think it was stolen. What makes you say that, I asked. Well, there was an armed robbery at the jewellers, and a whole lot of jewellery was stolen, and some of it was very valuable, especially a yellow diamond engagement ring that was worth a fortune. I knew in my gut that Roland had stolen that ring, but to hear my friend confirm my worst fears was utterly terrifying. If this got out, Roland could be looking at a prison sentence. Why had he done something as reckless and as foolish as this that could jeopardise our whole future together? Was he completely insane, I wondered. I thanked Beth for the information and raced to Roland's parents' house as fast as I possibly could and I whizzed down the bumpy, bumpy dirt track, parking my little car outside Roland's cabin. I knew without a shadow of doubt that Roland had robbed the jewellers, and I had to make it right and fix this problem before things got seriously out of hand. The cabin door was wide open, and there was no one around, not even Roland, but the place was an absolute pigsty, with clothing haphazardly gracing every available surface area. There was empty Chinese takeaway cartons and pizza boxes, as well as crushed beer cans absolutely everywhere. I started searching every corner of his cabin, trying to find the rest of the missing jewellery that he had taken. I was shocked to find that all the jewellery had been placed in a large coffee tin and was sitting close to the bright red kettle on the sideboard. Roland's toy gun was laying strewn over the sofa, but it was in such a good imitation that I realised that it could have easily been mistaken for the real thing, and I imagined it was what he had used during the jewellery robbery. I also discovered the remnants of the most ghastly facial hair accessories that I have ever seen in my life. They were thick and hairy, and there was a fake beard and a bushy eyebrows and moustache lying across the bathroom sink, and I realised that this was the disguise that Roland had used to change his appearance and he must have looked horrendously hairy in his disguise. I flung all the jewellery into my handbag and raced home, and then proceeded to pile on lots of red lipstick and put on an auburn wig as well as a dress that belonged to my mother so as to appear older than my natural age. I then placed the jewellery in a box, wrapped it up in a brown paper box with a red ribbon tied around its middle. A little, bill, a little bell jangled as I entered the shop, Hello, ma'am. Can I help you? said a jovial man, wearing glasses and a big smile. Are you looking for anything in particular? I'm looking for the manager, I said. I am he, said he, said the man. How can I be of service, ma'am? This is for you, I said. The man opened the box and pulled out the jewellery in his long, pale hands, and then his eyes grew wide with surprise. This is the jewellery that, that was stolen from my store three days ago during an armed robbery. Everything is here minus a very precious yellow diamond ring. Where on earth did you find this? Let's just say it came into my possession, I said. And with that, I walked out of the store, with the jeweller asking me to hold on, because I've got more questions for you. I ran to the car as fast as I could. Then I dived into the seat, turned on the engine, and pressed down the accelerator, and raced home at an unspeakable speed. The following day, I heard my mother and father talking together. They were discussing the papers, and my father read out some of the articles for us to listen to, while my mother fried breakfast of eggs and bacon on the gas hob. This was something we always did as a family, so my father would always read the articles so that we knew what was going on in the world without having to tune into the radio. 
my father read Jewelry Theft Mystery. A mystery woman with auburn hair ventured into the jewellers yesterday, presenting the store manager with all the missing jewellery that was stolen on Tuesday, with the exception of a yellow diamond ring of extreme value that remains missing. The manager described the mystery woman as a young, glamorous and attractive woman. She was well-spoken and polite, but I sensed she knew more about the robbery than she was letting on. When I tried to question her, she ran away. The jewellery store in question suffered a dangerous armed robbery at about 10.33 on Tuesday morning. The armed bandit was described as particularly hairy, with very bushy eyebrows, moustache and long unkept beard. It was difficult to see his face because of his excessive facial hair, but he did have a slender body and was about six foot tall. If anyone knows who the mystery auburn-haired woman is, who the hairy bandit is, or where the yellow diamond is, call us on 556-5567. Fancy that, said my mother in surprise. Who commits a robbery and then returns all the loot? It is very odd, said my father. Very odd indeed. The next day there was another newspaper report that read, Mrs. Rebecca Greenwood was walking her dog in the vicinity of the woods yesterday when she distinctly heard a very loud whistle and she sensed that someone very hostile was spying on her. It was a horrible feeling, she said. I knew there was a man staring at me because I felt his eyes on me and they were menacing and creepy. Suddenly I saw this yellow stone shining brilliantly on the forest floor. I knew it was the missing diamond that was stolen from the jewellery robbery. I picked it up off the ground and I heard the man rustling behind the tree and he was trying to deliberately scare me by moving with heavy movements, almost like he was pretending to be a bear or something big. But I was not buying his act. I think he was angry that I had found the ring because he thrashed the tree very hard and growled at me and sounded just like a lion. His imitation of the creature was very impressive, but I refused to be terrorized by such a bully. He was probably thinking I would drop the ring and run away in terror, but I am not easily conned. I believe this armed, unshaved, hairy bandit is living in the woods, and he was possibly looking for the lost diamond that he dropped, because I saw his metal detector that he was using on the ground, very close to where the ring was. I summarised I summarized he was probably searching for the thing before I showed up with my dog, and then he hid from me in case I was to identify who he actually was. I will not be going to the woods any time soon, because the armed bandit is clearly there. He even upset my dog, who usually conducts herself very well, but since she has returned home, her lavatory habits have changed dramatically, and she is wetting herself regularly. I have had to use nappies on her to prevent further accidents. I do believe this horrible man is to blame for my poor little nettles and for my poor little nettles anxiety. As you can imagine, I hooted with laughter when I read the article because I think Mrs. Greenwood possibly did encounter the creature I had seen the night before. I am glad to tell you that things settled down in the town and the robbery story was soon forgotten as other scandals invariably surfaced as they always do in small towns like ours. I did confront Roland about the jewellery theft because it was so out of character for him to have done something like this. I am glad to say that the deadly weapon was a toy gun, so no one would ever have been hurt. Even so, it does not excuse what Roland did, and the reason he did not ask me to marry him for eight long years was because he wanted to buy me a fancy beautiful ring and could not afford it. Instead, he took the jeweller's most expensive rare diamond. I still cannot believe what he did, but I know his motive was born out of love and giving me the perfect engagement ring. Roland and I have now been married forever, and I love him so much, but he could have been locked away if he had been caught all because of the stupid engagement ring. The thought of him having been locked away for this does not bear thinking about, but people do the craziest things for love. As for the creature in the forest, I was to find out years later that what I saw was a Bigfoot or a Sasquatch or a hairy man. 
You choose what you want to call him. One thing I know is that he's real because I saw him myself when I was hunting for the yellow diamond. Dear Sarah, my name is Cheryl and my story starts in the fall of 2013 when my husband Dave and I were taking a year off work just travelling around North America for a while. My husband was involved in the construction industry and was leaving his assistant manager in charge of the whole operation while we enjoyed a very extended, long-needed holiday. We decided to just spread our wings on this wonderful open road adventure with the whole world at our feet. My husband had recently had her heart bypass and he said he was not getting any younger and that life was for living and not for always working. You see, he came to cl so close to losing his life on three separate occasions with multiple heart attacks. So he just wanted to, s to use the time he had left for living life to the fullest. So that is what we did. And that was when the camper idea was born. We had met wonderful people during our travels and seen some marvellous scenic views that took our breath away from beautiful natural coastline, glorious white sandy beaches, to snow-capped volcanic mountain tips, lush green valleys, rounded hills, lily-covered ponds, gushing streams, silvery lakes and alpine forests. We had also seen so much abundant wildlife and even had an encounter with a mountain lion that crossed our path on one occasion while driving down a large dusty road. I remember it looked directly at us, rolled back its mouth to reveal very sharp teeth and gave us a warning growl. But we were so tickled pink to have had such an awesome sighting of such a formidable creature. My story starts when we were driving our camper van down Highway 1 from Westport, California, and admiring the ravishing views of the Lost Coast with the beautiful shapely rock formations bulging through the water's edge like great works of modern sculpture. We were glad to be travelling down this road in the fall because it can get very vicious during stormy days in this part of the world. And believe me, you want to avoid those conditions at all costs as some people have been swept to their deaths by punnelling aggressive windstorms in the past. Also, I cannot help but think that fall is always the best time of the year because the excessive heat of the summer as it has at long last retreated and been overtaken by the far kinder weather conditions, which for me is so much more preferable. Finally, we reached the last leg of Highway 1, which is where the redwood trees finally meet the coast, and then we travelled towards Legit. Please don't quote me on my navigational skills, because they're dreadful, and my husband does the driving, but this is roughly the route I remember that we took. As we drove, we noticed that the glorious redwood trees became larger and larger and even more imposing. Finally, we reached the town of Garberville, where we stocked up on all our essential supplies and proceeded on our journey towards our camping site. We travelled northwards towards the Avenue of the Giants and then past Humboldt Redwood State Park, which I've always wanted to visit, visit given all the activities available to visitors in the area. We were not going to be camping there because we had heard of a remote camping ground further afield, off the beaten track, that was far more preferable because it was so close to nature and next to an idyllic lake where there were very few campers and it was very, very beautiful there. Suddenly we found ourselves driving down this dusty red road, surrounded on either side by giant redwood trees that were so tall they towered above us with majestic trunks of brown bark covered with carpets of beautiful green moss. It is so gorgeous here, I gasped, and those trees are utterly extraordinary. They're so distinguished looking. Suddenly crossing the road, larger than life, was this hairy humanoid who was most definitely not a bear, although you could be forgiven for thinking so because it was covered in dark brown hair from head to toe and it had the longest arms I have ever seen, with human-like hands. The creature turned its head and looked directly at us for a moment, and that was when we saw the bullet-shaped head and the long face, the protruding brow bridge, the flat black nose. 
We also noticed that the eyes were big and brown and deep set and they stared at us only for a moment with an open curiosity. I also got the sense that it was upset that we had noticed it and it had been discovered. It then scurried away very fast because it really did seem to regret that it was seen by us. But this thing, the way it moved on those long agile legs, I would hazard a bet that this thing was faster than a cheetah and equally as graceful, if not more so. Soon it vanished from our sight and you could have heard a pin drop in the car as both my husband and I assimilated what we had just seen in a long moment of deep contemplation. What the heck was that? asked my husband, looking horrified. What in the world did we just see? It almost looked like the pictures of early man, because it looked like an ape man, I suppose. I never imagined that such a creature could exist in North America, but I saw it with my very eyes. The sighting disorientated us for a long time, because for a long time our encounter with the creature was all that we could talk about. We even pulled up on the edge of the road to compose ourselves for a long while because we could not believe what we had just seen and we were seriously rattled by the experience. I could see my husband was physically shaken and I was worried about his heart condition getting worse. Calm down, I said. My husband started to breathe into a brown paper bag and he took long breaths. Such was his shocked reaction from seeing that creature. I feel like I'm having a panic attack, he said. No animal has made me feel this way before. I can't stop trembling. The creature's gone, I assured him, and he wasn't in pursuit of us anyway. I could tell he didn't want us to see him at all. Maybe so, said my husband, but what the heck was it? Before we knew it, the day had retreated. The sun had set, covering the whole valley in glorious golden pink hues, and then suddenly the night set in, and it grew very dark. We tried to locate the campground we had been looking for, but it seemed to be so elusive, just like the Scarlet Pimpernel, because it was impossible to find. I now knew we were well and truly lost, and even our GPS sent us on a wild goose chase to what can only be described as the middle of nowhere. In the end, we just gave up and decided to find a small clearing where we could park our camper van overnight even though it might not be a legal place to park, but it was a risk worth taking and hopefully no one would notice us since the area seemed relatively remote. We found what seemed to be the most perfect spot to park, surrounded by the largest redwood trees I've ever seen, and they circled our van in the most perfect half-moon shape. It's so lovely out here, I said, setting up an outside table and chairs while my husband prepared the fire pit. I hastily prepared some Greek salad, and my husband cooked honey and mustard-flavoured chicken kebabs over the grill. It was already getting late, and I became ravenously hungry because we had barely eaten all day. Suddenly we heard a car pulling up beside our camper van, and a friendly-looking young man got out of the car, slamming the door behind him. He was wearing jeans and a white t-shirt and a dark brown cowboy hat that did give him a very sort of... I don't know, cowboy look. You do realise you're parked on private land, I said. He said. I explained to him that we had lost our way to the camping ground and were just pulled over for the night, but we were willing to move away if it was an inconvenience. Look, said the young man, rubbing his moustache in deep contemplation. This is my father-in-law's land. One of his sons was killed in a deadly car accident ten years ago when his car overturned during the night and crashed in that redwood tree, into that redwood tree over there, he said, pointing to the tree. My father-in-law has turned this little clearing into a memorial for his son, because it is where the accident actually happened. What? Someone was killed right here, I asked in horror. It gets worse, he said. Some people have seen Mark's ghost in this very spot you're camping, and even strange lights and orbs have been detected around here, so I thought I ought to warn you. Oh, I do not believe in the supernatural, I said, smiling, but we're willing to move away out of respect for the poor young man who lost his life here. What a tragic, what a terrible, tragic accident. It was tragic, said the young man, looking at us with misty, clouded eyes, as if covering up some tears. 
Mark was one of my best friends in the whole world. We grew up and hung out together all the time, which was where I got to meet his sister, who is now my wife. Wow, I said, that's some story. I spoke to him seconds before his accident on his mobile phone, you know, said the man with a sad expression on his face. Oh, my word, I said, you don't think that caused the accident. I mean, speaking on mobile phones has been known to be highly dangerous while you're driving. No, it wasn't that, it was something else. When I spoke to him, I've never heard him sound so terrified in all his life. I could not get him to calm down. He kept saying that he was going to die. He reckoned he was being chased by a couple of bloodthirsty, black, hairy, ape-like monsters who he said looked distinctly humanoid. He said they were pelting his car with huge stones and roaring at him. Wow, I said, thinking about the creature we'd seen earlier in the day. Could this thing have terrorized the poor man, I wondered. The description of the creature seemed uncannily similar to what we had just witnessed. What did the autopsy say, I asked curiously. I assume there was one. That's where the story gets more and more bizarre. It seems like the accident did not kill him straight away, but I think he was knocked unconscious. But they did find drag marks on the body, and his skull had been completely crushed, crushed by something very heavy. Worse still, it was suggested that rocks on the road had indeed overturned his vehicle. So you think these creatures killed him, I asked. I have no doubt, said the man, but we will never know who or what they were. Mark was no liar, so I truly believe his account. I've lived around these redwood for years, and you mark my words, there is something in those forests, and whatever it is, it's not good. Was he drinking that night, asked my husband suddenly, as if looking for another plausible explanation for this young man's sudden demise. No, said the man. Mark only ever drank on special occasions, so no, he wasn't drinking, nor was he taking drugs. Look, I said, I think we should get moving after everything you've told us. It doesn't feel right staying here overnight. I've got a bad feeling about this. No, please stay here, Mark insisted. It's very dark around here at night, and you'll be worse off navigating your way around those redwoods. Personally, I think you should stay here until morning. As long as you don't mind ghosts, he teased. A lot of people say they've seen Mark's ghost, and that's why I was warning you in the first place. We watched the man climbing back into his car and slamming the door behind him. He drove away, waving his hand at us. What a nice man! And what a terrible story, I said, looking at my husband, with a pained expression on my face. I can't believe what he just told us. That monstrous thing, said my husband, looking at me with wide eyes. The thing we saw today. Well, that's the creature that must have killed the young man. I agree, I said. The profile fits too perfectly, almost too much. It could not have been anything else. But maybe the one we saw was innocent. There could be others around. They might be the guilty party, rather than the one we saw today. My guess, it would be two territorial males, I suggested. I was awoken during the night to a loud crashing thudding sound, like something hitting hard against a heavy barrier, and I looked out of the window to see the bright headlights of an upside-down car flashing against the red redwood tree. I suddenly heard a car door being opened with a huge thud, followed by this heavy dragging sound, like a body being pulled along the ground. And then I heard a mighty crushing sound, like you would get if you stood on a thick ostrich egg, and crush it with your feet. I was terrified and proceeded to shake my husband violently. Get up, I cried. Something is going on outside our camper. My husband peered outside the camper window, window and I heard him saying, My God! He looked at me in horror. It's a reenactment of what happened to that young boy, he said. The one that was killed at that tree. We watched the flashlights of the car just fade, and the upside-down car suddenly vanished from our sight, and we saw some bright yellow orbs dancing through the red redwood trees. One of the orbs looked like it had the face of a young man in it, and he was looking directly at us and my husband, and I knew at once it was the young man that had died in the tragic scene. We almost got the impression that he was smiling at us, and so I waved at him, and surprisingly, in that orb, he waved back at us. Finally, all the activity stopped, 
almost as quickly as it had started, and the orbs just disappeared and faded into the night. It was hard to make sense of what we had seen, but it had been real, and my husband is able to validate my claims. The following morning, when I got up, I drank some coffee and wandered towards the redwood tree that was involved in the accident, and there I saw a memorial stone planted next to the tree, saying in loving memory of our beautiful son Mark, Gone too soon, you will be sorely missed. I then went and placed some flowers that I found growing in the valley onto the stone, and I wiped away a, sorrowful, a sorrowful tear. What a waste of a beautiful young life, I thought sadly. When we drove away from the area, I reflected on everything I had witnessed over the last 24 hours, and after some research, I discovered that the creature that we had seen was indeed a Bigfoot, and I believe it was Bigfoot-like creatures that had something to do with Mark's untimely death. So for someone who never believed in cryptid creatures like Bigfoot, or who be never believed in the supernatural, my camper van trip around North America opened my eyes to a whole new reality. And my husband and I are much more open th to things today, as we both have witnessed the supernatural and seen Bigfoot with our very own eyes. Dear Sarah and all your lovely listeners, my name is Ian, and I believe without a shadow of a doubt that my grandmother was killed by a Bigfoot. Of course, at the time, no one really knew that such a creature actually existed. And when my grandmother complained that she had been harassed and stalked by a hairy humanoid ape in the woods, no one really believed her strange account. My grandmother was a very truthful woman, so no one for a second thought that she was lying. But as is often the case with Bigfoot sightings, the sceptics invariably always bring the inevitable, it could have been a bear, to the table. I believe, as is always the case, with people who come forward to share their amazing Bigfoot accounts, that when they're ridiculed, disbelieved and dismissed, the first thing they do is shut up and keep quiet. I truly think that that is what ultimately happened with my grandmother, who bit her lip in anguish because no one understood the dreadful palpable fear that she was going through on a daily basis. No one believed her account, and so she lived with a tormented secret that ultimately ended, ended up leading to her own demise. So let me tell you my extraordinary story, and why I came to the ultimate conclusion that my grandmother may have been killed by a Bigfoot, or at the very least fought the creature off as hard as she could, and was accidentally mortally injured. I made this discovery in 1987 all by accident, so it was a long time ago now. It all started when my grandfather, who was a robust 83-year-old man at the time, and still in remarkably good health, decided to move into a retirement home. He relinquished his estate to me before his death, as he wanted to avoid all the inevitable tax duties that come from a deceased estate. As you can imagine, I was thrilled because my grandfather lived on 400 acres of pristine land in West Virginia, in a very beautiful, enchanting 1800s farmhouse that had been completely restored and renovated 20 years earlier, and since then had been fastidiously well maintained and kept in almost perfect condition. The house was situated on the end of a very large red dirt road, with a grassy embankment on either side. At the end of the road was a huge iron cattle gate, which opened up into another red dirt road, lined with very old, majestic, tall oak trees on either side. That ultimately led up to the beautiful house. This rustic farmhouse was situated on a very large, elevated, grassy clearing that stretched out for a fair bit. My grandfather had transformed that area into a beautiful yard with flower beds and vegetable patches. On the western side of the property were both outhouses and stables. There was also grazing fields for horses and cows. The house was north-facing, and the area in front of the house stretched back for miles with spectacular panoramic views over green blue rolling hills and thick dense green forests. On the eastern side of our land was a beautiful silvery lake, and several hundred yards from the lake was a large wooded area 
filled with an abundance of wildlife from deers, rabbits, hogs, squirrels, and you name it, pretty much anything and everything. Luckily, moving into my dad's property was not a major upheaval for all of us because we luckily lived locally, just a few miles away from him in a rented bungalow. So we pretty much could move in straight away, and that is invariably exactly what we did, much to the delight of my family, especially my children, Paula, who was 16, and Larry, who was 18 at the time. We wasted no time in settling into our new home and throwing out many of the things we would no longer need, like grandmother's old clothes and personal effects that my grandfather had never got to throw away after she had died, due to sentimental reasons. I think he felt so lost after she had died, and he could not bring himself to get rid of any of her stuff. I had several bin liners open over the gleaming oak wood floor, and I was just piling everything in them, without discrimination. I've always hated and loathed clutter, but my grandparents had been great at hoarding pretty much everything, and always stuff that they inevitably never got to use. I was pulling stuff off the shelf above the hanging rack in the closet, along with cobwebs and dust, and I retrieved an old shoebox filled with crumpled pieces of paper that had never been discarded. It looked like letters that my grandmother had tried to write, but she had crumpled up the paper in her frustration and never completed the letter. I knew what that was like. I had never been good at writing letters myself and often went through an entire pad of writing paper before I was finally happen, happy with what I'd written. I smiled to myself as I started to slide the shoebox into the rubbish bag, thinking that maybe my grandmother had more in common with me than I realised. Suddenly something stopped me in my tracks, and I retrieved the box and started to unroll the papers and read them. To this day, I just do not know what made me do this. My grandmother had been attempting to write to her brother Billy, who lived in Houston in Texas. I had only ever met him once or twice, and he was a really lovely man. I read some of the attempted letters that she had tried to write to him. And this one got my attention. It read, Dear darling Billy, I do not know what to do. I am at the end of my tether. I believe I'm in very big trouble. Every day, I'm being stalked by a hairy, ape-like man. I don't expect you to believe me, but I promise you it's true. I saw him in the woods once, and since then, I think he's been following me. In fact, I don't just think it, I know it. I feel certain that he's watching me all the time, and I'm so afraid to venture out of doors. I told Rolf and even Mother about what I'd seen, and they believe I saw a bear or something else, and that my eyes were playing tricks on me. I know what I saw, and it wasn't a bear. It was very definitely an ape-man. I confided in my friend Bess, who is a devout Catholic, and told her what I'd seen. She is convinced I saw a demon, and told me that I clearly needed to repent of my sins. And I've done all that. I've prayed, and I've even rebuked the thing, and it's still out there, still spying on me. So none of that stuff has worked. I think that this thing is not a spiritual being, but a very physical creature. But I've no idea what it is. But I truly feel as if my life is in impending danger, because this creature appears to be fixated by me. He has a very nasty smell about him, and he's very, very tall and very wide, and he has a very big ape-like face. But it's those intense eyes that scare me half to death. I wonder if you could move here for a while from Houston and help me to show my husband, Ralph, and the others that I'm not imagining what I'm seeing, and this thing is indeed real. I need them to believe me. This was the longest letter I found that was scrunched up in the box. In those days, I had never heard of Bigfoot, but it did seem incredibly odd that my grandmother was rattling on about an ape-man living in the woods. I decided to keep the crumpled note and asked my grandfather about it 
when I visited him at his retirement home. On the day I visited my grandfather at the old age home, I was surprised to find that he had acquired a girlfriend, and he had a very happy sparkle in his pale brown eyes. There was life in the old dog yet. His willowy, frail, elderly friend looked strangely familiar, and I remembered that she had dated my grandfather a few times, long after my grandmother's death. And had even stayed over at the farmhouse a few times. The relationship had ultimately fizzled out, but now it seemed that they had rekindled the old flame, and they both looked as if they were really very much in love, or at least extremely fond of each other. Pops, I said, that's what I always called my grandfather. I want to ask you something very private. Nonsense, said my grandfather, holding his girlfriend's hand tightly. I have no secrets from Rosie. Spit it out, son. It's about Grandma. I said, "Go on," said my grandfather. I found an old crumpled, half-written letter that Granny attempted to write to her brother, but she never sent it to him. In it, she talks about an ape man that she believed was a threat to her safety. Oh, that said my grandfather. That's nothing, son. I think her mind was playing tricks on her. There was no ape man in the woods. She had a big imagination, but I told her that, and she wouldn't listen. She was as stubborn as a mule. She was convinced she was seeing a, an ape-like creature, but I told her that she was very definitely wrong. Did you say ape man? Said Rosie, looking startled. I saw him too. What? Said my grandfather. Where did you see him? That time when we were dating for a while at your home. Remember the time I spent the odd weekend at your place. I saw the ape man then. The blood had drained from my grandfather's face, and he looked at Rosalie intently, with his steely blue eyes. You really saw an ape man? He asked. On my property, Rosie nodded, and tears poured down her pale blue eyes, and down her wrinkled pale. Thin face. Now, now, it's all right," said my grandfather. "Why did you not tell me about this? Because you would never have believed me. You don't even believe that your wife saw the thing. I can hardly believe that I saw it myself. So, why would you believe me? I do now," said my grandfather. "If two people say they saw the same thing, then it's good enough for me." What did the ape man do? I asked Rosie. I got the impression he wanted me to see him. He was making himself known to me. He wasn't hiding away. He was looking at me through the bedroom window, and he was huge. But it was those eyes. Oh, they gave me the creeps. There was something so sinister about them, their intensity, and the way it was looking at me. It was just so scary. How many times did you see him, Rosie? I asked. It was only the once, but I always felt when I was at your place that this thing was watching me all the time. I know I couldn't see him, but I felt it. It's hard to explain. You just get a sense about these things. I did not didn't like staying at your place. If you will remember, I started to decline some of your invitations because I could feel this thing around me and. He was horrible. He would grunt, and he had a horrible smell—a little bit like wet dog and skunk mixed together. I wish you had told me this," said my grandfather, rubbing his pale, her pale hands in his. "Tell me, pops, how did Gran die?" I asked suddenly. "It was twenty years ago, son. It was all an accident, and that is it. There was nothing suspicious about it at all." Well, let me see about that. Tell me exactly what happened. I asked. Try and remember. Well, I remember it was a Sunday night, and you remember Delilah. Oh, you mean the white fluffy dog that you once owned? That's right. Very nice dog too. Loved your grandmother to bits. Followed her everywhere. Devoted he was. What about Delilah? I asked. What has grandmother's dog got to do with her passing? Well, she went missing. You see, very strange it was. 
because it was so out of character for her to wander off like that. Well, you know, your grandmother couldn't understand it. She was fixated about that dog. Oh, she insisted on going off to find him. And it was dark outside. I told her not to. I tried to discourage her, but you know what she was like. Stubborn as a mule. She insisted. Well, why didn't you go with her? I asked, looking at my grandfather in horror. I thought she was going outside into the yard. I wasn't to know that she would go wandering off into the woods all on her own. Your grandmother always had a mind of her own. You mean she went to the woods by herself all in the dark? I asked in surprise. It would seem so. Well, that's where they found her body. What did the coroner say was the reason for her death? Grandpa, I asked. Oh, they said she must have hit her head very hard and broken her neck. It was an accident. These things happen, son, especially if you're foolish enough to go tumbling around in the darkness like that. If you ask me, you're asking for trouble. Your grandmother was very foolish. I'm not sure about that, Pops. I think her death is highly questionable. I really do. How do you know that this ape man didn't actually harm her? You think this thing killed her? asked my grandfather in horror. I do, Pops. I really do, I said. I mean, Granny felt her life was in danger. I handed my grandfather the note my gran had written, expressing her fear about the ape man. My grandfather read the note, and his grave face looked very solemn. I had no idea she felt this way, he said, looking very reflective. I really think I failed your poor grandmother. After her death, Delilah was never the same dog again. You know, she never left the house. She spent her life curled up in your grandmother's closet. She was always very anxious. It was very, very sad. When I returned home that evening, I was wondering what on earth this humanoid ape actually was, and if this creature or others like him presented a possible threat to my own family now that I was actually living on my grandfather's land. Was this thing still alive, I wondered, because if he was, both my wife and daughter could be in danger, because he clearly had a fixation on woman. I never told my wife about my concerns, but I searched the woods on my land thoroughly and covered every area by foot, carrying my Remington rifle with me at all times, but I never encountered the strange creature, so I assumed that he, I assumed that he or whatever he was had moved on or was deceased. I truly hoped the latter was the case, and it was plausible because I doubt apes have the same kind of life expectancy as a human, but then I don't really know. Several years went by. My grandfather had passed away by then, and so had his lovely girlfriend Rosie. One day when I was out hunting in the woods with a friend of mine on the deer stand that I had constructed in the woods a couple of years earlier, we noticed that the forest had become airily quiet and we knew that we were not alone. I could sense something was watching us, and my friend Hank was looking very anxious and extremely unnerved. It was the creepiest, most sinister feeling that I've ever encountered in my life. We watched a couple of little saplings swaying vigorously, and we could hear the sound of something hefty in the undergrowth. We knew at once that this creature, whatever it was, had to be enormous, and both Hank and I were both immobilized by total fear and stood on the deer stand like a couple of ice statues frozen to the spot and literally unable to move. That is the effect the presence had on us. I wanted to run away, but my legs felt like heavy blocks of solid concrete, and I could tell that Hank was worse off than I was, because there were beads of sweat pouring down his face like raindrops, and his terrified eyes were as wide as saucers. And this, we hadn't even seen the creature yet. Suddenly we saw the head of a very large black beast, with a monstrous ape-like face staring at us with dark menacing eyes through the undergrowth at about eight feet off the ground. And it was the most terrifying thing that I have ever seen or encountered in my entire life. It was like I was looking at a movie. It was so surreal. 
I wanted to fire at the thing, but my two seventy Remington rifle felt like a BB gun in my hands, and I was sure I would probably make this thing so mad. So I put and put both Hank and I in mortal danger, and I didn't want that to happen. The creature was making strange grunting sounds that sounded like a primate, and although we never saw his entire body, his movements in the brush reminded me of a massive ape. This thing, whatever it was, kept studying us through the curtain of shrubbery, with a steely gaze, like a great bird of prey that scans the ground, looking for a potential snack. That was the kind of look he was giving us. Suddenly, we heard another grunting sound coming from further away, and I remember thinking to myself, "Oh my goodness, not another one!" And in that moment of startling revelation, I shat my pants in utter terror. In that second, Hank just passed out and fainted, falling onto the ground in a semi-conscious state. The creature suddenly lost interest in us, as he appeared to be distracted by his friend's call, and suddenly he just turned around and thundered through the undergrowth, like a bulldozer rampaging through the thicket. I immediately did my best to revive Hank, and we both went home, but we could not run. Because the energy had drained from both of us, and it was all we could do to just crawl home. On reflection, I do not know whether the creature was going to hurt us or not, because it never growled at us, no, not once. But those eyes were just so intimidating, and this creature was formidable. I have never felt so overwhelmed by terror in my entire life, because we were quite literally facing an apex predator. I still live on my lovely plot of land, and go hunting from time to time, but I have learnt to listen to my instincts, and I will always turn away from a hunting expedition, if the woods grow unusually quiet, and the bird song recedes. When it's like that, I know at that time to get out of the forest. From time to time, when it's dark outside, I do hear whooping sounds, and wood knocks coming from the valley. And all these years later, I know that they're coming from these creatures. If I'd not known any better, it would have been impossible to believe in the existence of such an extraordinary apex predator, that is as elusive, and as potentially dangerous as this one invariably is. I still believe my grandmother was killed by the Bigfoot, and I often wonder whether the missing dog was a ruse by the creature to lure my grandmother into the woods late at night. I think these creatures are highly intelligent, and so it would seem like a pretty clever plan. It would have been the most perfect setup. Judging by my grandfather's accounts, that little mutt was clearly spooked by something. Maybe the cute creature had no intention of ham- harming my grandmother, because he was clearly fixated by her, like a stalker with a very serious crush. So it could have been an accident. If my grandmother had fought back, and I imagine she would have, to her detriment, I will never know what actually caused her death. But the one thing I feel sure of is that the hairy man ultimately had something to do with it. You may, of course, disagree with me, but that's my story. Well, I just want to thank you so very much for that amazing story. And I do think that it's highly possible that the dog was used as a ruse by the Bigfoot, because it does seem to me that he had a fixation on women. He clearly had a fixation on the grandmother's,、uh, the grandfather's new girlfriend when she went to stay at the property. So that really leads me to suspect that he must have been fascinated by women and probably wanted to kidnap one, and he probably tried to kidnap the grandmother. And then failed to do so, and as a result, she died fighting. That's what I actually think happened. But you might think differently, dear Sarah, and all your lovely listeners. My name is Esther, and I'm initially from Philadelphia. And my bizarre encounter happened in 1996. But the perplexing question I have that I still cannot answer to this day was: Was this terrifying beast that actually hounded my family? A Bigfoot, or wasn't it? This mystery is one that I may never be able to answer, and it hangs over my life 
with a cloud of uncertainty, because I've always hated not having a solution for a problem or an answer to a question, and to this day I have no idea what we encountered. My story begins in 1992. My husband and I had decided to buy a large plot of land at the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains. We chose the perfect idyllic location for our home. The building involved a mammoth task, bringing down large trees, bulldozing and flattening the land. I designed the house myself from scratch. I wanted to create a very large, spacious, traditional-style farmhouse, with wide windows, whitewashed walls, a charcoal slate roof, and a very large wooden deck for entertaining purposes. My plan rolled into action, and I was very excited about the project. It took us three whole years to finally build the home, so we were only relocated from Philadelphia once our house was actually completed in the summer of 1995. I had no idea it would take this long. I had never lived in the country before, but my husband and I dreamed of raising our two sons in a rural environment, where they could grow up with the fresh air blowing against their faces and become more acquainted and attuned with the natural world, such as plants, animals and birds. I rarely thought that it would be an inspiration for them to become more resourceful and independent as young men. Finally the day arrived for the great move to take place, and my sons were enthralled and excited about the whole idea of a brand new life in the country. I had promised them that we would raise horses, chickens, goats and a couple of pigs, and my children were over the moon about the prospect of owning their own animals. My son Dylan was eleven at the time, and Niles was twelve. It was so exciting settling down into our new home and transforming it into a cosy family den with snug furnishings, cosy large fireplaces and a country-style kitchen that I'd always dreamed of. I also prepared my own little kitchen garden with herbs, vegetables and beautiful flowers. My husband was able to find work locally and it was decided that I would stay at home to raise the kids something I'd always longed to do. In Philadelphia, I had worked as a secretary for a financial advisor, so I had no regrets of leaving that life behind. But even so, moving to the country was not without its challenges and was a huge adjustment for me. I had always been a very social, outgoing kind of person, so invariably there were times when loneliness set in and there were times that I got very down. The first year in our new home was a major adjustment for my, for my husband and I, but the kids were so resilient and settled down exceedingly quickly. As I had promised, we got three goats, two horses, two pigs and several dozen free-range chickens. And I also acquired a very cute white fluffy elderly dog called Maya that I rescued from a shelter, and she just followed me everywhere, becoming a devoted constant companion for me. My two sons would spend their lives playing out in the woods. They just loved it out there. They would ride their bicycles, play with BB guns, engage in all kinds of boyish games and funny pranks. My boys developed a huge passion for photographing unusual birds, and so they began to spend a lot of time bird watching. so they always carried a bird book with them and a pair of binoculars. One day in the summer of 1996, they decided to set up a tent in the woods as a place where they could hang out and play. It was that day that would bring about an event that would ultimately change our lives forever, and there would be no turning back. As my children were pitching their tents in the wood, they suddenly sensed that something was watching them, and whatever it was, it made them feel distinctly uneasy and sent chills of terror down their spines. They also noticed that the forest had become airily quiet and the natural chirping bird song had all but receded, which they found exceedingly odd. My son even described the wind taking on a menacing ambience and also the forest as becoming almost unfriendly and hostile towards them. They looked around but could not see anything and then suddenly they detected a movement high up on one of the trees. My older son reached for his binoculars to have a better view 
of what it was, and he almost dropped them in horror, hardly daring to believe what he was seeing with his eyes. Standing there, on an extended tree branch, staring down at them, with huge, blazing red eyes, was an eight-foot giant-like humanoid monkey, weighing about six hundred pounds. He was covered from head to foot with dark, black, matted-looking hair that was both messy and unkept. The hairless face was exceedingly black, so black that it made the facial features of this thing, whatever it was, almost non-distinguishable. The creature had exceedingly long arms and black hands, but the sharp-pointed nails were like eagle's talons, and the creature had a very long tail. The hairy humanoid monkey swayed on the tree provocatively, from side to side, as he stood on the branch, staring at my children with demonic red taunting eyes that ravaged their hearts with a very palpable fear. In terror, my older son screamed out to his brother, Run! 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 As fast as you can! Run! And both my boys sprinted out of the woods as fast as their legs could carry them. They heard this monstrous beast jump off the branch onto the forest floor with such a force they even felt the heavy vibration under their feet as this demonic beast chased after them at a very vast speed. My younger son told me that his legs felt like they were giving way beneath him as he ran and he was so numb by a paralyzing fear that was unlike anything he had ever experienced in his entire life. I was making strawberry jam on the gas hob of my cooker at the time, when I heard the front door crashing open as my boys bounded into the house and bolted into my kitchen with faces as white as sheets and eyes as wide as saucers. I could sense my children's palpable terror as they revealed to me that they had witnessed a huge monkey-like monster in the woods. I knew my children were not prone to making up stories like this, but I have to confess it was very difficult for me to di digest such a scenario. It seemed so implausible and so far-fetched. Even my husband was so dismissive of my kids' claims and believed it had possibly been a case of misidentification and that they had stumbled upon a black bear and highly exaggerated their encounter. Our parental responses to our children's wild claims did cause my kids deep frustration. They were adamant about what they had seen. When they told a couple of kids at the local school what they had encountered, they were teased relentlessly. So I noticed my kids became very subdued, and they never ventured to play in the woods. Instead, their games outside were relegated to our yard, which was in very close proximity to our front door. Despite my efforts to encourage them to explore the woods again, they avoided the area like the plague and simply refused to go near them. I imagine that tent could still be parked out there to this very day. One morning I was outside in the yard, hanging our family washing on the line, when I felt that something hostile was watching me. I imagine this is how a deer feels when they sense that a predator is around. The only way I can describe it is that you just know instinctively that you are not alone. It was a beautiful sunny day, and as my eyes surveyed the whole area around my home, I saw absolutely nothing. But I felt such a menacing presence that the hairs on the neck just stood up on end, and I hurriedly retreated back into my home. That evening I told my husband about my creepy, surreal experience and he told me that my kid's encounter with the hairy monkey was feeding my imagination with crazy wild ideas. I hoped he was right, and I wanted to believe him, but I knew that what I'd experienced that day was hauntingly real. Even little Maya, my white-haired little mutt, refused to go outside on that occasion. She had appeared anxious and frightened, with her tail tucked between her legs, which was so unusual for her. She retreated to a little dark corner in the side of our refrigerator and remained hidden in that spot for almost the whole day. One night I woke up to the frightened squeaks, squawks, grunts, bleats and oinks 
from all our farm animals that we owned, making the most terrifying sounds, almost as if they were being hunted down by a predator. I could hear the sounds of our two normally very docile, easy-going mares neighing frantically and pounding the stables with their hooves. My husband raced hurriedly out of the house, armed with his rifle and a flashlight, and was convinced when he ventured outside that he'd heard something very heavy bolting back into the woods at a thunderous speed. The next morning we woke up to find that several of our chickens had been beheaded and their heads were scattered over our yard like confetti, and only a couple of the bodies had even been snatched. So whatever this thing was, it clearly enjoyed terrorising my farm animals just for fun, as if it was a game for him. Naturally, I was very concerned by what was going on, and my kids were totally convinced that all these strange happenings were a result of this mysterious creature that they had encountered in the woods, the monkey man. I was on edge because I truly sensed that my cosy country home lacked the warm sunny countenance it had once possessed, and seemed as if it was enveloped by a cold heavy feeling that seemed to coil its way around our home, sucking and draining the life out of my family like a monstrously big bow constrictor. That's exactly what it felt like. One day my husband brought back a carcass of a deer from work, given to him from a family friend who was an avid and keen hunter. We were going to gut, skin and finally store the meat in our deep freezer for future meals. The deer was left on the outside table on our wooden deck just for a moment. And when my husband returned to gut the entire thing, the whole body had just vanished into thin air, which left us wondering who or what had actually done this. Later that week, my husband found all the dead bones of the deer carcass ripped clean, lying on the forest floor, and the skull was perched menacing, menacingly on a large tree branch, staring at my husband with its empty, hollowed-out, ivory-white sockets, like something from a sinister horror movie. It was on a Thursday evening when I wondered why my husband had not returned home yet. I was convinced I'd heard his car coming down the long drive, but I knew that I must have imagined it, because my husband never appeared. I was not concerned because my husband had told me that he could possibly be late from work that day. But three hours later, my husband bolted into the house with a look of total terror on his face. I had never seen him look so horrified in all his life. He was shaking like a leaf and was simply unable to say a word to me. So I took him into my arms and consoled him because I sensed that he had experienced something quite horrific but I couldn't imagine what. My husband was a very tough guy who did not get anxious easily, so his horrified demeanour really unsettled me. After swigging down several shots of brandy, he finally told me that he'd been driving down our drive and then he'd pulled over to the side because he thought he'd seen a very large black humanoid, humanoid hairy form crossing his path. He then decided it must have been a trick of the light and so he backed his car and then parked it for a moment. He was just about to get out of the car to have a clearer look when suddenly this car, his car was attacked by this monstrously huge creature that pounced on the car roof and literally screamed at him through the window shield, glaring at him ferociously with hauntingly red demonic eyes. He said that this thing was so hugely chilling that he thought he was, it was going to prize him out of his car like a tin opener and then finally kill him. After a lot of shrill, shrill, shrill shrieks from the creature, screams and howls, it finally retreated back into the woods, but not until he had accomplished his mission of scaring my husband half to death. The following morning we discovered that my husband's black car had been scratched very severely by three sharp fingernails that had prized off all the black paint like cheap nail varnish leaving scratches and threes all over the roof, the doors and the boot of the car. It had taken a serious beating as areas of the car had been smashed inwards, forming circular dents in the heavy metal. It looked like my husband had been in a collision on the highway. It was that bad. When my husband took the car to the panel beaters, 
The guy looked at his car, and his eyes grew as round as saucers, and his chin dropped to the ground, and he said, What the hell happened here? And my husband said, Don't ask, because if you do, you'll never believe me. I think the final straw for us was when my husband and I went to have dinner with newly acquired friends of ours who had lived in the Appalachian Mountains most of their lives. When we shared our intriguing story with them, we were surprised to find that they actually believed us and told us that they knew of all kinds of encounters with strange cryptid-like creatures in the area that go back for hundreds of years. My friend looked at me earnestly and said, There is something in those woods that can never be explained, and I have seen things there myself that defy rational explanation. I begged her not to tell me her stories because my life was haunted enough and I didn't need to hear any more. We returned home from our dinner that night to find heavy branches strewn over our entire yard and a couple of our windows were smashed in with large boulders and there were carcasses of dead animal skulls hanging all over the awnings, strategically placed to intimidate us. Our farm animals were all in a state of absolute terror, and Maya, my little dog, was curled up in a tiny frightened ball under my bed. I was so glad that my sons had not been home that evening when all this chaos had transpired. The very next day we put our house on the market, gave all our animals to a local farmer we knew well, and literally hightailed back to Philadelphia, leaving pretty much all our worldly possessions behind us, which literally meant the new owners got everything we owned. I did warn them about the monkey man we had seen, and he laughed at me as if I was off my head, and I can't help wondering if he's still laughing now. I was thrilled to get back to Philadelphia, where we rented a place for a while, and became reacquainted with all my friends. I knew that when I went to bed at night, I didn't have to worry about the menacing creature that was lurking in our woods. And for my whole family, that was a welcome relief, and it meant a good night's sleep for all of us. I do not know whether this creature was a Bigfoot or not. Maybe your listeners would know. I'm not sure that it was, because it had a large tail, and its hand had very definite eagle-like talons on the end of its human-like fingers. Its girth was about three feet in width, which I imagine is not quite as large as the average Bigfoot. I cannot say that the creature had a cone-shaped head, although it was very large. As for the features of the face, they literally got lost in the darkness of the skin and were hard to distinguish, so I cannot describe them to you. My husband says that the eyes were very blazing, traffic light red. Some may say by my description that this creature was a demon or demonic. To look at that would be very plausible, but the trouble is this creature was very physical. I assure you all the prayers in the world did not inhibit or impede this creature in any way. My husband told me that the teeth were much more canine than human-like and were like white daggers and exceedingly sharp. I do know that Bigfoots do tend to have human-like teeth. So all these years later we have no explanation about what this monkey creature actually was. Dear Sarah and all your lovely listeners, my name is Sasha. That's not my real name, of course, but for the purposes of this story, that's what I'm going to call myself. I am Native American from the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota, which is home to my people, the Oglala Sioux Tribe. The area where I live is vast wilderness, covered with beautiful valleys, meadows, mountainous ridges, wooded areas, and vast areas of extremely flat grassland, dotted occasionally with clusters of trees. This Indian reservation is about the same size as Connecticut, and there are over 15,000 people living here. And the area does have a lovely small town feel about it, as many of us know each other by name. Our reservation is the second largest in the United States, and definitely the poorest, as about 92% of my people live below the poverty line, and the unemployment here is rife. People battle here to survive the challenges of daily life, as housing conditions are poor, and many people are caught up in drugs, meth, alcohol, ga gangs, marital abuse, and the list goes on. So invariably we do have a high suicide rate on the reservation, when people are driven to the depths of despair 
and cannot cope any more, which is incredibly sad. The encounter I'm going to tell you about fits the profile of a real Bigfoot-like creature, but many people on the reservation believe that what was encountered that day was a spiritual being known as the Tall Man. The Tall Man is a taboo subject in my culture that is not to be messed with. It is considered a harbinger of doom, and after a sighting of this creature, there are usually multiple deaths that indeed follow. However, this creature that was witnessed on this occasion was a very physical entity that was clearly flesh and blood, with a very definite thermal heat signature, making it significantly much more dangerous. My story starts on the 11th of March 2006. I was 22 years old at the time and living with my mother in a tiny bungalow next to other similar houses all identical in appearance. So sadly our home was neither special, nor individual, nor unique. We lived next to a very pretty creek and opposite a wooded area of natural wilderness. My mother made our home really very cosy, even with the limited finances that we had. She had a natural artistic flair that was always able to turn a sour's ear into a stunning silk purse. So our home was really cosy and inviting, giving the false impression that we wanted for nothing, which in fact was really far from the truth. Life was always exceedingly hard, but I was extremely lucky to have a great education behind me, and both my mother and I were lucky enough to have very respectful jobs in the local town. I vividly recall the day of my strange encounter with such a crystal clear clarity, almost as if it happened yesterday. I do remember it was a very bright, cheerful day, and the ground was still powdered with a thin layer of pretty white snow. Even though it was a crisp, clear, cold, lovely day, I woke up with a strange sense of foreboding in my gut. I really got the feeling that something dreadful was about to happen, but I could not imagine what it could be. I had experienced these ghastly premonitions before on a few occasions and had always been proved right, as many of my tribal ancestors were gifted with the second sight. I knew that I also had inherited similar extrasensory abilities from my family line, so I had these same nagging feelings of inevitable doom on this day, and on the day that my dad died of a sudden heart attack when he was only 35 years old, and another time when my sister had a miscarriage seven months into her pregnancy. I know on those two separate occasions, without a doubt, that something bad would happen, and those two occasions were among the most oppressive, despairing days of my entire life. I remember feeling that familiar, airy chill all over again on this day, and I racked my brain trying to run through the possible dreadful scenarios that could potentially occur during the day. Suddenly a picture of my 73-year-old grandmother came into my head, and it occurred to me that maybe she was going to die today. I mean, what else could it possibly be? Only recently she'd been complaining of having heart palpitations. I immediately got dressed as quickly as I could to go and visit my grandmother at the Pine Ridge Retirement Home. I knew I needed to say goodbye to her, if she was going to pass away, and I wanted to be there for her. I got into my car and made the journey, hoping with all my heart that my grandmother would not die before I got there. That was how confident I was in my premonitions. I arrived at the retirement home to find my grandmother with a pink glow to her face and looking healthier than I had seen her look for a very long time. She was laughing and joking and in unusually high spirits. Hi, Gran, I said, taking her into my arms with a huge hug. I love you so much. My grandmother looked surprised. It's unlike you to be so emotional. What's up, dear? Oh, nothing, I said. I just don't tell you enough what you mean to me, that's all. Well, dear, that's very sweet of you to say that. I never thought I'd be seeing you today. Why are you not working? I phoned in sick, I said. I wanted to make seeing you today my top priority. My grandmother looked pleased, and then I finally asked her the awkward questions about her health that she rarely ever wanted to discuss. How are your heart palpitations, I asked her. The medication is working well, dear, and the doctor says my ticker is in very good shape, and my blood pressure is almost perfect. As you can imagine, 
I was surprised to see there were no signs that my gran was about to pop her clog, so to speak. But I knew that people did sometimes suddenly just pass away without any rational explanation. So I decided that I needed to stick around with my grandmother for a little longer. Later in the morning, my grandmother took me to the television room to watch her favourite soap on television with some of the elderly friends. The television soap came on and all eyes were glued to the screen. And that was when strange things began to happen almost immediately. I noticed in my peripheral vision a movement coming from the window that was nine feet off the ground and I could sense that something or someone was watching us and peering in at us. Whatever it was, it felt very dark and sinister and sent shivers of dread down my spine. I turned my head towards the window and saw this black hairy humanoid form with a very large face staring in at us. I could not see the face clearly because all the features seemed distorted and the face was very black. Almost it was like the area of your television screen that suddenly goes incredibly fuzzy. The sinister dark eyes were not clearly visible to me, but I did feel the penetrating, hostile gaze. I could hear fearful cries as the terrified elderly ladies cried out in horror. Some were crying, others were pointing at the window and gasping with jaws dropping to the floor and terrified eyes as wide as saucers. One of two of them let out the most horrifying shrieks that caused the retirement nurse to come running into the room. What's going on? What's going on? What on earth is going on? When she saw the massive black being at the window, she started shaking like a leaf and trembling violently like a very wobbly jelly. Her terrified demeanour did little to calm down the ladies that were becoming increasingly frantic by the minute. Finally, the nurse was able to gain some composure and calm everyone down, and then she called the police. I stood there watching everything that was going on, and it felt as if I was out of my body watching a terrifying horror on television that was so gripping that I had become a part of it. It was that surreal to me. The creature started to move away from the window as the sounds of police sirens approached ever closer. I went over to the window and watched the humanoid creature gliding away gracefully. And truly, he was faster than a cheetah and equally as agile. And then he finally just vanished from my sight. I could hear the police sirens stop, car doors slamming, and the concerned voices of officers. Then there was the commotion from the old ladies chattering excitedly inside the television room with horrified voices that registered both fear and yet extreme curiosity. What was that? What on earth was that? What was that? Did you see it? It had such a big black face. What was it? What was it? What if it comes back? wailed another. I tried to calm everyone down while I watched all the proceedings from the window. I noticed the nurse pointing up to where I was standing. She was chatting to the police officers very earnestly, with an intense fearful expression all over her face. The police officers were nervously clutching their guns on their sides while they walked around the premises cautiously as if half expecting to run into the strange creature. After they inspected the premises thoroughly, they continued to chat and finally got back into their vehicles and drove away. The terrified nurse came flying into the room, reassuring everyone in a nervous high-pitched voice that the very strange creature had gone and there was no sign of it anywhere. It's all right, she said. It's gone. And the police assure us that they'll routinely check on us throughout the day. I'm sure it won't be coming back. The police think it's possible it could have been kids playing a prank on us. That was no prank, cried out one woman. Whatever that thing was, it was real. I knew the lady was right. The creature I'd seen was covered with raven black bedraggled looking hair from head to toe. It had a very large torso with willowy long slender arms that could have touched the ankles they were that long. The creature was nine to ten feet tall and easily eight hundred pounds without exaggeration. I do not know what the head looked like or the face, which was a little frustrating because it left me with more questions than answers. What was this thing, I wondered? Maybe I would never get to know. As the day retreated and darkness made its presence known, the night seemed airily still and quiet as the chorus of crickets and frogs 
seemed to have no desire to engage in their musical song. An awkward heaviness enveloped the air with oppressive energy that seemed to snake itself around the residents in the Pine Ridge community that were sensed by everyone. Even the dogs would pace around their yards with nervous strides, and they could be heard barking, howling and growling throughout the night, unsettling the residents who were having extreme difficulty in getting to sleep, because they too sensed that something was seriously off. Suddenly the police station was inundated with 911 calls from residents who had experienced brief sightings of this exceedingly tall humanoid being that seemed to gallop through their yards on its long legs, leaving any onlookers feeling totally shaken with terror. One resident assured the police that if the creature came close enough to him, he was to shoot it dead, and that was for certain. The police chief, who was a Native American at the time, was called out from his cosy evening at home with his family and kids to investigate the plethora of 911 calls received at his station. The reports of this mysterious beast, whatever in God's name it was, kept streaming in from worried residents. He was convinced that the creature was a supernatural being known as the Tall Man, a harbinger of doom and a messenger of impending death. As the chief and his partner drove the vehicle into the centre of town, their glimmering flashlights caught the sight of the hairy humanoid ten-foot creature crossing the road. It looked in at them directly through the car window. The police were utterly terrified and could hardly believe what they were seeing with their eyes, and the hairs on the back of their necks stood up on end. They kept saying to each other, What the heck is that? What the heck is that? I've never seen anything like that before. The creature possessed a powerful, formidable presence and roared at them like a lion, and it waved its arms like an octopus. It was difficult to see the dark face clearly as the features of this creature were obliterated by the darkness and were not clearly distinguishable. It was with astonishment the police found that this mysterious, strange creature had a very strong heat signature. So whatever it was, this thing was a physical being, and there was no doubt about that. They watched it running away with enormous strides and with incredible grace, and then it disappeared into the pine woods close to the houses on the other side of the creek. The police were in hot pursuit of the creature, communicating with each other on very inadequate walkie-talkies at the time. They saw the creature racing towards the creek, and they watched it finally disappear from sight, and then it was gone. As you can imagine, for weeks after the strange encounter, those who had witnessed the mysterious humanoid creature were divided by what they had actually seen. But in my culture, we do not like dwelling on encounters like this. Many of us are seriously superstitious by nature and do not like talking about such things, so we tend to keep our mouths shut. Sometimes I wonder if the creature was a Bigfoot at all, but I will never really know what it was. But I know this, it was real. It was breathing, it had a pulse, it had a heartbeat, it had a physical energy and a strong presence. Whether something physical could also be supernatural at the same time, I do not know. But I know this, again and again I will tell you, this creature was real. I do not believe there were any major deaths in our area after the sighting of the so-called tall man, but where I live we do have a v relatively low life expectancy, and I believe it has a lot to do with the hopelessness many youngsters feel about their futures. With poverty, drug abuse and alcohol addiction, there are people in our community who invariably die from the complications of these diseases. I do not believe these deaths ultimately have any connection to the tall humanoid that was seen on that cold, crisp March day in 2006. I believe my premonitions on this March day were related to the strange humanoid that I was to see. Luckily, my grandmother lived for another ten years after this incident, much to my delight. Living on the reservation, there have been strange sightings in the area that we cannot explain. On two occasions I have seen the apparitions of two elders in my tribe who died over a hundred years ago, and they were riding large black horses and thundering across the valley in their tribal regalia. 
I was astonished to see them because it was the first time I'd ever seen a ghost in my entire life. But they did vanish before my eyes. I was asking myself if I had really seen what I thought I saw when I noticed my mother standing beside me. Did you see them? she asked me, stroking my mane of black hair affectionately. I nodded. I did. They'll be back, she said, possibly in a month or so. What do they want? I asked. I'm not sure, she said. I think they're looking out for their people. I smiled because my people rarely need looking out for. You know that too. One day something really strange happened. As I told you, we have a very high suicide rate in our reservation. And one day a young 16-year-old kid killed himself and his poor mother was beside herself. She was so devastated. I was washing dishes at the kitchen sink and my mother was drying them when we saw the ghost of the boy who had taken his own life. He was wandering around the creek area close to our home and we had a great view of him from the kitchen window. He almost looked as lost as he had been in life. I think he was surprised to find that he still had a consciousness after death. He possibly thought the gun he had used on his head would obliterate his existence, and was probably hoping it would, I imagine. He was wearing the same clothes that he was found in, a beige pair of trousers and a blue and black plaid shirt. You could tell he was a ghost because his body looked like a photograph that is a little out of focus and a lot less bold in colour. Suddenly we heard the sound of horses' hooves across the valley, and we saw the ghosts of the two elders on horseback, and as they cantered across the valley, they lifted the dead boy onto the horse with them and cantered away. I could hardly believe what I was seeing. It looked like they really were looking out for the people after all, and taking this poor lost soul to a better place. I was so happy for him. I told the boy's mother what I had seen to comfort her, and she said her boy had come to her in a dream that night, riding a black horse, telling her that all was going to be fine. The poor mother seemed so comforted by the experience, and also by what I had told her. Maybe the two old elders on the stallions helped the people who died on, die on the reservation to cross over. I don't know, but I thought these accounts would be of interest to you and your listeners. And, well, I just want to say... That story is absolutely fascinating, and I do not know what you encountered. I, I just find it extraordinary, because Bigfoots do tend to have very big arms, and this creature had very slender arms, and you couldn't see the face at all, nor could you see the eyes. But on the other hand, this creature was covered all over it with hair, and it was a very physical being, so could it be supernatural as well? I truly don't know the answer to that question. But I do know this, that is a fascinating story. And I am very sorry about the poverty that is in your reservation. Um, that must be just so heartbreaking, the challenges that you must experience on a daily basis. It must be really tough for your people. But I did love the story of the elders coming to collect the poor lost soul. What a wonderful story. Well, hello there. I hope you enjoyed the Omnibus edition. We've got many more coming our, our way for you to listen to. Sending you love wherever you are in the world, in North America, Canada, Kenya, wherever you may be, I send you lots and lots of love. Thank you for listening to my Omnibus, and I really do hope you enjoyed it, because that's the whole idea about it, is to give you some interesting stories to listen to. So until next time, Goodbye and good night.